So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Christopher Hallam from UV Systems, and today we're going to be discussing a webinar based on electrical inspections, uh, using ultrasound as an addition to your thermal imaging inspections. So just a few uh, housekeeping rules for today. This webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later on today. There will be the opportunity throughout the presentation for you to ask questions to me through the chat group. I will do my best to answer any questions as we go along, but if we do not get chance to cover those questions, I will take a copy of all of the questions today and I will get back to you after the webinar as well. So, to make sure that this is all working correctly. This is live, so if we do have any technical problems, please bear with us. So, as I was saying, my name is Christopher Hallam. I am the UK and Ireland manager for UE Systems uh, Europe. My contact details are on the screen. So, if you do want to ask questions afterwards from the webinar, or if you want any further information or support, then please feel free to email me. Um, you can always give me a call as well. So a little bit about UE Systems, first of all, um, and who we are. So founded back in the early 1970s, uh, we are a manufacturer of airborne and structure-borne ultrasound equipment. Uh, we're not a service provider. We provide the equipment, the software, the training and support to enable people to be self-sufficient. Headquartered out of uh, Elmsford in New York, um, the American side of things are. We also have regional headquarters on all continents throughout the world. I myself come under part of the European headquarters in the Netherlands and we have within the Europe regional representation in the UK and Ireland, Germany, France, Spain, Poland, Italy and Eastern Europe. So we're not going to go into too much detail about the basic principles of ultrasound as we have covered that over our previous webinars. Um, if you haven't had the chance to look at those, you please feel free to go onto our YouTube channel and you will find them. Uh, what we've been doing over the previous months is building up the picture of how we use ultrasound from the very basic principles and then delving into the applications. Uh, we will have another webinar next week on a different application. So far we have covered the basics and we have covered mechanical inspection and lubrication. So today is all about elect uh, electrical inspections and how we can improve what we are doing already. So the first question we need to ask ourselves really is, are we taking our electricity supplies for granted? Okay, is, are, we, are we actually just flicking a switch and things expecting things to go, uh, operate as such we rely so much on our electricity supplies so if we don't have a supply of power then we're going to have no operation no product output so it's one of our most critical assets you could say within our facility so are we paying enough attention to our actual supplies is an annual infrared inspection enough i, I do speak to a lot of users out there that part of their inspection methods is just an annual tick off from a thermal inspection. Is that actually enough? Um, and do our site safety standards make it harder for us to inspect with just thermal imaging alone, for example? Are you allowed to open up your cabinets? Do you have thermal windows, thermal ports and that to be able to do your inspections? Is there other ways that we can add to those inspections to help us get more from it? Um, in my opinion, I think it's something we do take for granted day to day, we flick a switch, things come on. So when it comes to electrical inspections, using ultrasound technology is an efficient method for detecting electrical faults in its early stages. And we're gonna elaborate on that a bit further as we go through this and what sort of things we can detect and how we detect it. So how is it detectable, first of all? So airborne, structure-borne ultrasound uh, technology will detect turbulent flow. So think of anything that creates turbulence, be a pressurized system or anything like that, generates ultrasound, which we can pick up using an ultrasound device. Now, when it comes to electrical discharges or ionization, 
from our electrical assets, that ionization produces turbulence in the surrounding air. And that turbulence generates the ultrasound, making it detectable with ultrasound. And we can do two ways of inspecting uh, electrical subsystems with airborne and structure borne ultrasound. And we can use the airborne approach, centered our frequency at 40 kilohertz, and also using a contact approach using 20 kilohertz as our centered frequency. So traditional methods of uh, electrical inspections, the one that most people will be using and doing as such, will be using thermal imaging. Obviously, if we have the breakdown of a conductor, we have an increase in resistance. And that increase in resistance to the current flow within the system will produce heat as a byproduct, enabling us to visually see with thermal imaging where our hotspots are, for example. So that's going to tell us one part of the story that we've got a resistance buildup, a, a heat buildup that maybe shouldn't be there. This also requires eyes on of our components and our test area to be able to do that. And uh, in recent past, I've heard from a lot of service providers and people that do these inspections that say, well, our new safety standards say that we cannot open our cabinets. Uh, so making it a lot harder for them to actually gain access to the inspections. Maybe with the introductions of IR windows or ports, it can help improve that. But then we can think about, is there another way we can combine with this to help do those inspections as well? So as I was saying about turbulence, a complementary approach, adding to our um, ability with thermal imaging, because the deionization produces turbulence, which means that the ultrasound generated from these discharges is directional in nature. Ultrasound transmits in one direction stronger from its source. So using an airborne method or contact approach, we can listen for where the source of the sound is strongest. So we can easily identify where something's going, coming from. And that's without being intrusive. Ultrasound doesn't penetrate solid structures. So we can use airborne modules to listen to air gaps around cabinets, for example, or from a distance. Or we can use a contact method on the outside of our cabinets or structures to listen to what's going on inside, improving the safety aspect with regards to this. So that way we can maybe use the ultrasound, first of all, to pinpoint where any of these emissions are coming from, and then use our thermal imaging to compound that, to show the evidence of those things. And I always like to um, preach, you could say, a two technology approach to any sort of maintenance inspection. The, it's about having the quality of data, not loads of data, but the quality of data to prove what you're, you're actually trying to achieve. So using ultrasound, we can hear the problem. And then using thermal imaging, we can see the problem. Evidence is key when it comes to this and visualizing and using our senses to help show and justify what we want to do is key. You might be a service provider saying to a customer that you've identified a certain thing, but they might not be convinced. If you can give them as much the, the best quality data, then you can justify your argument and your case. And again, they work hand in hand in this case. So a couple of advantages to adding ultrasound into a thermal, ins thermal imaging inspection on electrical components. So how can we improve that? So as I was saying, ultrasound is non-intrusive. We can use it on all voltage levels, on any electrical subsystem. Um, we can inspect from safe distances. Um, it doesn't have to be open. We can actually do it on enclosed systems. So using a contact approach. Um, making it safe. Um, it can also, ultrasound can also detect um, electrical discharges that are non heat producing, for example, and we'll come on to that a bit further as well. And then combining those two up, it gives us a really safe, structured approach to our inspection methods. So, what can we detect ultrasonically when it comes to electrical inspections? So the first one being corona, tracking or arcing. Some people may refer to these as partial discharge. There are many different types of discharges that we can uh, that can occur that will come under the umbrella of partial discharge. We can also pick up mechanical looseness, 
when it comes to our electrical subsystems. Each of these phenomena will produce their own type of sound characteristics. So being able to perform sound recording with an ultrasonic device will actually help us too. And ultrasound equipment out there have the ability to do the sound recording. And then looking back at the sound content, we can then do analysis to actually determine what's going on. And we're going to go into each of these uh, subjects in a bit more detail now, along with some case studies. So first of all, uh, the corona effect. So it's normally defined as the glow or discharge of um, air surrounding our conductors. If we have um, a conductor above um, a thousand volts, um, the air surrounding the actual conductor itself or the insulation can um, stre be stressed beyond its ionization point, um, trying to look for a path to ground, but it, it, it can't find it. So we're hearing that crackling noises. You may have heard this um, on a damp day, for example, under power lines, over overhead power lines, for example. Um, corona effect itself is not always a destructive um, phenomena and can sometimes be referred to as nuisance corona. Um, it's kind of it's, it's there. We have to think about the atmospheric conditions at the time uh, when we're actually picking this up. Um, but a byproduct of corona or any sort of discharge is uh, nitrogen oxide. Uh, it's like a white powder buildup. And again, that's actually not um, a massive problem until we actually mix it with some sort of moisture, water, for example, and that will turn to um, nitric acid. And that nitric acid can be highly corrosive. And if we have that mixing around on our conductors or insulators, that's going to be a problem for us. Um, another thing about corona is that it doesn't produce heat in its early stages. It may produce heat as we've got corrosion due to the nitric acid, for example. Um, but it's something that thermal imaging may not pick up. Um, I have a quick question here. You're talking about partial discharge. You're talking about high voltage systems, the same as not seen on low voltage systems. If you have any sort of discharge uh, um, with any sort of electrical subsystems, um, a discharge is a form of partial discharge, uh, be it tracking, arcing, corona, for example. Um, corona, we know that happens at medium to high voltages, but depending on your region and your local authority will depend on how you define what is low, medium and high voltages. So signatures of corona effect um, normally talk about things like nausea, sickness, um, maybe a headache. Oh, hang on, sorry. No, that's, um, that's when I drink too much corona. We need to talk about the real corona here. So actually a sound, sound signature. Sorry, it's my attempt at a bit of humour there. But the sound signature from corona is highly repetitive. Uh, due to coro negative corona actually happening at its most negative point of the sine wave. So if we think about an alternating current sine wave coming from our electrical substations, for example, um, whenever we get to the most negative point of the sine wave is when um, corona occurs. It's when those electrons from our atoms that are surrounding the, the air around us are breaking free from their actual outer shell. Now, this is going to be highly repetitive because it's following the most negative point of the sine wave. So what we might find is the sound is highly repetitive. We'll see in our FFT, for example, if doing sound recording, we may get harmonics relative to our line frequency. And that line frequency will be either 50 hertz or 60 hertz, depending on where you are in the world. When we then look at the time series waveform of a sound recording, we will start to see repetitive amplitudes and uniform discharges because, because again, it's happening at the most negative point of the sine wave. So here's a quick case study of um, some corona actually occurring. Uh, this was an inspection of a substation at a chemical plant. Um, Medium voltage inspections, they define their medium voltage as anything between one 
thousand volts and 60 kilovolts. Um, this was an inspection prior to any planned downtime for them to decide and define what might need replacing or what might need cleaning. They performed an airborne inspection and this is the sound that they heard. So I hope you all heard that clearly. Um, what we could hear there is repetitive crackling sounds. Um, and what we do then is perform a sound recording and we can analyze the FFT and time series as to what's going on. We can pinpoint it to the edge of the insulator there. And as we can see in the FFT, we have some low level indications of a 50 Hertz harmonic. And when we look at the time series waveform, we can see very repetitive uniform discharges occurring. So defining this, we could define it as low level corona picked up. But we also need to think about considerations to atmospheric conditions such as humidity must be taken into account as well. Um, this could be a small amount of dirt buildup because dirt around an uh, insulator or conductor can also cause a buildup of corona. Um, from what I understand from this site, once they actually had the planned downtime, they cleaned up the insulator and the corona was no longer present. But if left, we could have had a buildup of nitrogen, nit nit nitrogen oxide, eventually turning to nitrous, nitrous, nitric acid, which in turn could have caused a problem in the future. So it's just keeping it on top of our assets there with this. The next subject we're looking at is tracking or surface discharge. Now, Tracking occurs when there is normally a breakdown of the insulating material around our conductors. Um, if we're getting any moisture within the actual conductor itself can also cause tracking. This is where we're having current flowing outside of the conductor itself along with the insulation, um, sometimes causing carbonized tracks. Um, it's finding its path to ground a different way and, and can be very destructive in nature. Um, so picking this up again is gonna be helpful for us. So the sound signature of tracking, um, I promise I'll try not to crack any more jokes. It will be non-uniform in nature. It's gonna be more sporadic discharges. It's not going to be uniform anymore because of the condition that we're looking at. And it may vary in intensity. Depending on the level of emission, the level of um, tracking that's actually occurring, we may or may not pick up harmonics based on, again, electrical line frequency, uh, 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz. Um, relating to an electrical based sound. In the time waveform, when we look at the sound recording over a period of time, we will, like I say, see non-uniform discharges, maybe varying in amplitude of emission. Um, and what they will, you will find is they will be very short in duration, very thin, small spikes when it comes to this discharge. So a case study here for using airborne ultrasound, first of all, when it comes to tracking. So this was a service inspection of a power, power distribution within a building. Um, this is a service provider that uses um, thermal imaging and ultrasound as part of their standard inspection procedures. Uh, what they would do is first of all, go into a room and the first thing they would do was will be using airborne ultrasound to scan the environment, listening for anything that's abnormal. And if they pick up anything abnormal, because ultrasound is directional, they can then pinpoint and define where the source of the emission is. And as part of this inspection, they picked up this sound. We can hear something there that's quite, it seems to vary a bit in, in the level of sound. Um, it doesn't sound very uniform, but it sounds abnormal. So looking at the sound recording from the FFT and the time series, we can see again, a low level 50 Hertz harmonic bass there that can tell us that it's 
electrical sound in, in quality. So it's electrical bass sound that we're hearing. And then looking at the time waveform on the bottom of the screen there, the one on the left is the 15 second recording. And then we have a zoomed in one and we can see that we've got varying amplitudes of discharge and we can see that they're short in duration. It's not uniform. The sound was coming from a 400 volt cabling from, a trans from an 11 kV transformer. And visually, you can see from this that there's some white buildup, some heat, heat there. And this was then confirmed with a thermal imaging camera that actually there was a small hotspot there. Now, this was a new install and the customer at the time didn't necessarily believe that there was actually a problem here. But using the power of thermal imaging and ultrasound together here, we can determine that actually tracking was occurring. So in this case study, it was quite good that the service provider was able to then turn the lights out and take a video recording of actually what was occurring. So what you'll see in this clip here is actually evidence, physical evidence of what actually was happening at the time. see from this video recording that it was quite evident to see that tracking was occurring and if this wasn't picked up it would have caused a serious problem eventually so great use of the two technologies to highlight what's actually going on so I can see people are starting to say that they can't quite hear me over the sound so what I'll do is I'll keep my best to keep my mouth shut while we play the sound recordings once I finish them I will then carry on. So thanks for the heads up. So going on to arcing being our next um, case study and next phenomenon that we want to detect for. So arcing occurs when electrical current um, or electrons jump across conductors here, causing the surrounding air in that area to become more conductive. Um, this can be highly, highly destructive and causes a serious problem. Um, we also need to consider things like arc flash. Um, and are making sure that we're wearing the correct PPE when providing any sort of inspections or doing any sort of maintenance on these things. It's very, very important to show respect to electrical subsystems. So the sound signature of arcing is going to be something similar to tracking, but it's going to be non-uniform in nature again have sporadic discharges occurring, uh, varying in intensity and amplitude of sound. Just like tracking, depending on the level of emission, we will possibly see some harmonics relating to an electrical based sound. And in the time waveform, what we're going to see now is non-uniform discharges, but what they're going to be is more intense in the duration of the discharge. And as you can see from the time waveform on this screen below, it is actually more intense discharges. That's a key indicator that there's uh, arcing occurring because it's more abrupt, there's more energy behind it. So a quick case study on arcing when it comes to using the airborne method, first of all, I have a couple on this one. So this was a service inspection on an electrical cabinet and using airborne um, ultrasound, they picked up this sound. So as we can hear, there's a lot of crackling going on. There's a lot of, it's very non-uniform in nature. Um, looking at the FFT and the time series, we can see 50 hertz harmonics just about peeking through and on the time waveform we can see non-uniform discharges some are more intense than others so there may be a little bit of tracking going on in here but there is also arcing going on because ultrasound is directional we can use thermal imaging to pinpoint exactly where the source is coming from as well we can confirm what the ultrasound is actually picking up 
Um, and in this instance, there was quite a lot of audible ambient noise coming from this as well. Um, you can see the temperature is quite high on this connection, and there's actually physical, visible um, signatures there of a serious problem occurring. So using the two technology approach on this, we can then share that data, report on it, and actually raise our justification behind that. And we're doing it from a safe distance. Um, we could even use ultrasound before this is even opened up. This is just using airborne ultrasound around the sides, picking up those sounds. Another way of doing it is using the contact approach. If we are not able to open something up to do an inspection, we can maybe do a pre-inspection using ultrasound with the system closed. So this was another service inspection of a distribution cabinet prior to access using the contact method on the actual body of the cabinet itself. Inside this one, we know that there's no moving parts, so it should be relatively quiet. There should not be much sound in this, in this actual cabinet. So this is a sound that they picked up. So as we can hear from that sound, it doesn't, very, it doesn't sound very normal. It sounds very abnormal for something that has no moving parts inside. As we can see from the FFT, there are small indications of a 50 hertz harmonic, but looking at the time waveform, we can see non-uniform pattern, very intense in duration. It's quite intense bursts of sound, discharges. Now, if you were out to as part of your service inspection open that cabinet up and you pick that sound up first of all before opening it are you actually going to want to open that cabinet while it's live this is a good indication or good test to do to actually prior to opening it because you might decide actually no we're going to open that up once it's run down for example because it's a safety barrier and thinking about things like art flash too So I've just had a quick question in here about how um, ultrasound will um, drown out, for example, audible, um, audible sounds in the environment. So with the audible sounds in the environment, that's at a lower, air, lower frequency for us humans to listen to. Um, ultrasound is listening in the frequency range of 20 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, way outside of our human hearing range. So we're not picking up sounds that are audible in nature. So this is very localized. And uh, especially if you're using the contact approach, um, you're listening to what's going on inside that structure. So that helps us with filtering out all of those sounds that we can hear audibly. And that's one of the benefits of using ultrasound is that we can use it in a noisy environment because it's not listening to those frequency ranges. Um, somebody else asking a question here about um, would we use ultrasound as a primary instrument and then only use infrared when identifying an issue? Um, no, I would not agree with that. Um, I, would, I would suggest that it would complement your thermal imaging because you may start getting a resistance buildup before there's any sort of discharge. And that's, your, that's another indicator there. Depending on the voltage levels that you're looking at will depend on what technology is more likely to pick up a problem in its earlier stages. So on the lower voltage systems, um, thermal imaging is going to be um, better at picking up early signs of a small resistance buildup. And as we go through the voltage ranges to the higher voltages, ultrasound will pick up early emissions on the high voltage systems before thermal imaging. So it very much um, complements each other, I would suggest. That's the, my, my personal recommendation. So uh, someone just asked a quick question there about the previous case study. On that one, it was arcing occurring. It was actual arcing inside the actual distribution panel there. So the next um, phenomenon we're looking at is mechanical looseness. Picking up loose connections, for example, or loose components that are in our subsystems. So a loose connection can lead to severe damage with our assets as well. Um, loose connections can vibrate free. They could then touch with other contactors, for example. Um, 
in, in my previous um, engineering careers with the railway sectors, we've, we've seen where loose connections can cause severe damage and actually cause deaths. For example, in the railway industry, um, Potter's Bar rate, rail disaster rings to mind when a loose connection actually made contact with something changing a light and caused the train to plow into another one. So loose connections can be very serious problems. Um, with a loose connection, we get a vibration. It, it, which produces friction. Something is rattling. Something is causing a vibration which causes friction, which is also another thing that produces ultrasound, friction. So we can listen for the impacting of very small, very low, very sensitive vibrations, very loose connections. So this is an area that some people can sometimes confuse with corona because corona is highly repetitive. And a vibration from a loose component will also be very repetitive. But what we need to think about here when doing an inspection on an asset is that corona only exists above a thousand volts. So if we're looking at a subsystem that's actually below a thousand volts, we know that corona cannot exist. So if we're hearing a highly repetitive sound and it's below a thousand volts, it might lead us to understand that there's something else going on, like a loose component. When we do pick up something like this, because it's directional and locatable, we may pick up um, sounds or harmonics in the FFT that are at a different frequency range. Because something that's vibrating loose will not necessarily vibrate at a rate of 50 hertz or 60 hertz, for example. Um, an example here on FFT, we have harmonics based at 29 hertz. So straight away, that tells us that it's not an electrical based sound in nature. It's a mechanical sound. And when we look at the time waveform, we will start to see highly repetitive impacts, just like you would with corona. But this time, when you look a bit more closely at the discharge or impact, it will give you more of a fishtail sign on the waveform, which if you think about how you would ring a bell, if you strike a bell, you have a increase in amplitude and then it rings out, it uh, attenuates like a fishtail. So having a fishtail indication on the time waveform is also a good indication that you have something that's mechanically loose or vibrating. So a case study using airborne ultrasound for mechanical looseness. This was a service inspection on a distribution panel. Using the airborne ultrasound, they picked up this sound. As we can hear from this sound file, the sound is highly repetitive. And if you also listen to the tonal quality, it's a little bit more coarse in nature in sound. It sounds a bit more mechanical just to listen to it. If we look at the FFT, we're starting to we now see harmonics at 100 hertz only, not relating to electrical line frequency necessarily. And using thermal imaging, we can pinpoint a small temperature increase there on one of these switches. Um, that could relate to some sort of vibration that's causing a little bit of heat. Um, this was a clear indication that we had a loose connection on one of our switches there. So nice and easy to point out using the two methods once again. Looking a bit deeper at that sound recording, so the first bit we saw there was the FFT showing us our 100 hertz harmonics. This is the time waveform of that same sound file. And as you can see along the time series there, it almost looks like there's mirror images of the vibration happening. It looks very, very repetitive. Amplitudes are the same. And then when we then take a slice of this time waveform and look a bit closer, we can see the fishtail pattern of something that's ringing out. Just like I said, when you strike a, a strike a bell, you get the increase in amplitude and the dissipation of the sound. So this helps us with compounding actually what is happening with that asset. So just notifying loose connections there and using the source of the sound to identify the area, the thermal image then 
showed us exactly as well, it confirms it. It's that data to help us suggest what we're actually finding. So with these case studies that we've been talking about today, um, I wanted to share the sort of equipment that these users that we have out there that share this information with us. Um, UE systems ourselves, again, none of these um, case studies shared today were actually performed by ourselves, but by our users, by people that use the technology. And we provide us a level of support when it comes to um, data analysis, for example, when people are in the early stages of learning and building confidence. So people send their sound files to us because they have the ability to do sound recording. And these users were using the Ultra Pro 10,000 and Ultra Pro 15,000 um, because these two devices have the ability to sound record. And if you have the ability to sound record using the data management software and the Spectralizer software that comes with the equipment, they can do a bit of analysis themselves, but they can also share it with us and we can provide the support to help them understand what they're doing too, to build that confidence behind the technology. So that's what was used and using contact modules and different versions of airborne modules doing things from a safe distance there's also sometimes a need or a thought requiring of online monitoring remote monitoring of your assets do you deem certain parts highly critical that you want to know as soon as there's a problem there without having to be there um, and this is a, a new product from UE systems called the foresight and with the foresight, we have the ability to actually use this to continuously monitor our assets 24-7. Um, it will be then quietly listening away inside these cabinets, listening for alarm conditions. And if it hits these alarm conditions, it will then notify the user of a problem at any time of the day. And it will do that as a sound recording and decibel value. So you can then gauge a baseline for the, amp, the, the relative sound being generated without a problem being there, and then setting an alarm level just above that. And the good thing about this is, is that if there's something that clicks in or out, for example, and raises an alarm, you don't have to go out there. You just listen to the sound recording that was taken. And then that way you can determine if it's actually something worth looking into further. So the way that this works is, for example, you would have your electrical cabinets or your assets, and inside each of these would be a airborne remote access sensor that's listening for the emissions. This would be connected to a foresight smart box, which would be then connected over a network using data management software and Spectralizer. And this will then continuously monitor your assets listening for any alarm levels being generated or any ultrasound being generated. Once that happens, it will then perform a secondary sound recording and it will then notify you by email or text message, for example, of what's actually happening. And then that way you can do an analysis before you even go to that area to look at what's going on. So really handy way of looking after your assets 24 seven. Um, as I was saying, when a point enters an alarm condition, it performs the sound recording sends it to you and as I was showing there all of these case studies are, are using the UP 10,000 and 15,000 and Spectralizer software the Foresight uses the same software too so you can add this as part of your um, routine inspections so some final considerations um, to actually using ultrasound for airborne inspection with your thermal imaging is that safety is paramount when it comes to electrical inspections um, I'm an electrical engineer by trade and the thing about um, doing these inspections is to not be afraid of electrical subsystems but show them the respect and make sure that somebody that's doing these inspections is qualified, is qualified to do these inspections because I wouldn't want somebody that's not qualified in electrical principles or electrical knowledge to actually go out and do these inspections. Um, I would always, I would never say that ultrasound replace thermal imaging because they both have their place and working together they can give you that great data to perform an in-depth inspection and do it from a safe distance for example or before opening an asset so <clears throat> a couple of questions about foresight covering all voltage ranges so um, foresight we'll be able to cover all voltage ranges but what we need to look at here is 
what sort of anomalies are we looking to detect for? So um, when it comes to electrical inspection, um, ultrasound is more beneficial um, on the medium to high voltages for a discharge. On the lower voltages, we're more likely to pick up with ultrasound things like vibrating components, for example. It very much depends on what state the electrical systems are in already, for example. Um, I had a long time, period of time where we do a lot of high voltage case studies and then all of a sudden uh, a site's having an electrical inspection done for the first time in years. The electrical system is not in a good state and they pick up all sorts of problems. Um, what you'll find is, is that the um, foresight remote access sensor airborne module would be per cabinet, for example. Um, each foresight box will be able to take up to four sensors. So you could then put one sensor per cabinet, for example. Um, I hope that um, you've all enjoyed this um, presentation today. Um, I have lots more case studies on this sort of thing. Um, there is a lot more detail to electrical inspections. I mean, I used to teach uh, electrical principles to engineers in their early years of training, and there's so much more we can go into, but we want to try and keep it as simple as possible and straightforward. Um, you can feel free to ask me a few more questions if you like over the chat group. You can also email me um, on my contact details. On our website at uesystems.com, we also have a learning center where there are lots of applications, lots of guides and tutorials and case studies that you can have a look through too. <clears throat> so, yep, anybody that obviously wants them things, I'm, I'm seeing some messages coming up here. Um, I will get some information to you guys what you need to. Um, if there's any other questions, please feel free. I'll stay on the line for the next few minutes. Um, but otherwise, this will be recorded. We will have it uploaded onto our YouTube channel. And we'll always be happy to help. But today, thank you for your time, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it.